Hello everyone. Welcome to the NPTEL course on remote sensing and GIS for rural development. This is week nine, lecture five. In this week, we have been looking at remote sensing tools and data sets that can aid in assessing irrigation, water demand and land resources. Managing irrigation is one of the toughest things in India because we cannot be just regulated to monsoon crops, rain-fed crops. In order to improve the livelihoods, increase the productivity sustainably, we will have to irrigate in the off seasons also. For example, vegetables. If you're going to wait only for monsoons during <coughs> vegetables, then only seasonal crops can be done. So that is why vegetables and fruits and flowers, all these are big uh, impact on the economy. We need to sustainably cultivate them, apply water, which is irrigation during the non-monsoon period. Non-monsoon period is of two types, Rabi and Zai. It is important to have water resources available and if not readily available, groundwater resources are taken. Unfortunately, groundwater resources consumes a lot of water for agriculture. Almost 89% of the groundwater that we extract is used for agriculture and 2% for domestic and 9% for industries. We hope that this system changes with more better access to water and new technologies to reduce the water demand and or use novel techniques and hybrid or native crop varieties that consume less water. Millets is one crop that everyone should embrace. The government of India has promoted millets as a revolution to the United Nations which gracefully accepted it and declared the current year as the millet year. That's why you would see a lot of uh, millet activity happening in this 2023. Millets consume less water, more nutritious, by default organic. It doesn't need fertilizers or pesticides. And it was a stable food that we had for generations. So these are very important because groundwater is less uh, used. And when we come to groundwater, as I said, there's less data available in the government and private sectors. So we used remote sensing as the nature of this course. We had visited GRACE, and this is the image of GRACE uh, satellite output uh, that you could see that the earth is revolving to show where the mass is high. Uh, so mass is always high on the um, uh, extreme hilly regions. You have the hill uh, regions along the uh, mountain regions along the Himalayas, the Alps, um, and so you see Himalaya regions, etc. So you see a bulge. It is red because it is decreasing in water, uh, terrestrial water storage, and that is mostly the snow melt. And, and the poles are also shrinking, right, because of the ice uh, shrinking happening. Uh, also, the Greenland, which comes around here, this part. Uh, also has been noted to lose a lot of water um, in the um, aspect, right? So I'm going to sh stop here to show uh, the green, um, green, how green, uh, Greenland part, and then the Arctic, Antarctic regions also have been noted to have uh, less water. Grace also has ocean data, so that is why you see the data continuously throughout the globe. Uh, unlike other data, which only captures uh, the images, here you have a value um, and the value is converted to a pixel value. So the, the Earth's surface is not a smooth surface. It has uh, uh, abnormalities, uh, heterogeneities in mass, 
And because of the mass change, there is a difference in the pull on the satellite and the satellite accelerates and deaccelerates. So this has been converted to um, uh, a gravity anomaly, uh, which is then converted to a terrestrial water storage thickness. If you remove some components, you get groundwater and soil moisture separately. So with this, uh, I will continue the discussion on one more important aspect is that coming back to the slide that we had uh, started to show that uh, the groundwater recharge is happening uh, and there is a lot of depletion happening uh, on, on, on a different scale. So there is recharge. However, there's more water taken than recharge. So there is over exploited and critically exploited uh, regions in India. And uh, that mimics that follows where uh, both rain fed and um, irrigated crops ha happen, especially irrigated crops uh, as the um, as discussed in the, um, the, the legend. You can see that the irrigated crop lands are green. So along the green areas, you see a lot of groundwater depletion in the uh, CGWB data set. So here and here is almost the same. Uh, you don't have uh, depletion along the Ganges most of the regions because of, um, because of the uh, recharge happening. But if you recall the GRACE data anomaly, the Ganges basin is also depleting very, very heavily. Uh, and it is mostly because of India side, not the China and Bangladesh or the um, uh, Tibet side, because those are very, very small. Maybe Nepal also is there. So Nepal also gets a lot of uh, irrigation. So there's a combined effect of irrigation and also climate change, pulling the groundwater resources out. Uh, and that is why we have a depletion as per GRACE data in the Ganges Basin. Also, terrestrial water storage, which is the terrestrial water storage, is mostly the snow melt, and that can happen in China, uh, Tibet, uh, India, also because a lot of the snow cap regions are in Nepal, China, and Tibet. If there is a snow loss, that reflects considerably on the grace data. So now we have looked at this. This is we look this as a groundwater aspect from CGWB and grace data, but there's something else which is important: uh, the water resource as a recharge. Um, and then estimation of groundwater impact is important, but why is the groundwater going down? Why is the irrigation demand high? It is high because of the crops. We are using certain type of crops uh, and therefore there is a necessity to identify the crop statistics. So let's see how uh, a crop statistics is uh, needed. So better crop data is needed. So initially what the government does is um, it sends a lot of team uh, on the field to collect data, uh, both at the state and the national level. The data is kept together as an agricultural statistics. And that is also shared with the water boards like Water Resource Department, WRD, uh, PUB, Public water, Utilities Water Board, and also the Central Groundwater Board and other boards that monitor and manage the water resources. However, if the data is lagging in time, and if the data is having some errors and issues, uh, then we will not have good estimates of the water demand and water use. So that is what we are going to look at in the next slide. Why do we need crop statistics? So let's have uh, an analysis. Uh, stakeholder, this is after a big review. A lot of literature review has been done to arrive at these conclusions. So let's look at um, what, what um, this crop data is needed for. So stakeholders requiring area crop statistics uh, include government, uh, national, state, local departments, uh, because they have to give water, release water from dams based on the crop data, right? And if the crop data is wrong, then the release might be wrong. And the farmers might be upset that either too much of water is released or too less water is released. Uh, and so there is a crop damage. Also, other subsidies are targeted around this crop statistics. For example, fertilizers, which is highly, highly subsidized in India and pesticides. So the farmers pay around 20% in some regions. The, the rest is paid by the government of India. Uh, there's loans given as per crop statistics. They will give you a loan on your crops, right? So if your crop is growing, uh, you want to finish the crop harvest, you need some money, you can apply for a loan. 
they'll give you a loan. Land alone is not uh, important. Your land can be barren. Uh, barren land is not uh, counted as a land for loan. So coming back, government uh, resources are used uh, considerably. Policies, scheme design, and budgetary allocations are done, uh, wherein you have multiple policies that can uh, help to save water, save budgets on fertilizers, if you have good crop estimation. Then, of course, you have scheme designs, uh, especially the scheme designs for the farmers, uh, the loan scheme, the uh, water canal schemes, WA associations, water user associations, etc. All these schemes are better applied to the, to the farmers and the public if there is a good crop statistics data. So policies, scheme design, uh, and budgetary allocations are very, very important, uh, especially for farmers. So we put farmers as a key stakeholder. And within the farmers, uh, land record info, crop loan subsidy are being acquired by the farmer if the statistics is correct. For example, the farmer goes to the water uh, board and says, uh, for my uh, field, I need water. And he says, "You, I'm growing paddy. I'm growing sugar cane. Well, the government officer might look into the records and say, no, you're growing mustard. I cannot give you um, 10,000 uh, liters. I'll give you 5,000 liters because your uh, mustard doesn't consume almost half of sugarcane or not even half. So why should the government give you so much water? So uh, this argument comes when there is a difference in the statistics between the farmer and the government officer. Same for subsidies as power subsidies for pumping groundwater uh, and subsidies for uh, your um, crops, uh, loans, crop loans are there, mudra schemes, etc. And also your subsidies for fertilizers, storage, other accessories. So that is very, very important. Land record for crop loan subsidies. The other, which is very, very important in the recent years is compensation. Due to climate change impacts, there is a lot of negative impact on the farmer side. The crops are lost. Let's say you have a big uh, flood uh, coming or a big uh, rainfall event, all the crops are down. So that is it. The, the water is just stagnated in the soil for a couple of days. The roots rot and the plants die. So in that time, there is a team of uh, central government employees and uh, state government employees who go down and assess the damage and then they give compensation. So this is very, very time consuming uh, and there's a lot of delay and also non-representativeness because every one hectare of land cannot be assessed. So wherever the officials go is the official record. If they say they sample for one village, two, three places, that is the average they'll apply for the entire village. So this is very, very uh, costly. The officials come time consuming, they take time, and then the compensation is given to the farmers. So that is one aspect where you actually need high resolution uh, statistics of crop data. Then you have your insurance uh, and uh, insurance agencies. So you have to insure. So the, the Pradhan Mandri insurance scheme is also there for crop protection. Uh, and that is based on the crop type for a particular land and geolocation. Uh, for example, if you're growing a paddy in Kashmir, they will not give you insurance because it is cold. You should not be growing there. You should be growing saffron, flowers, uh, some types of fruits, kiwis, etc., but not rice uh, and, and uh, um, uh, sugar cane, for example. Yes, high altitudes, for example, in Nepal, high, high altitudes, you have rice. Uh, but very, very less yield will come. So, so for that yield, you cannot get a big, big um, loan. Uh, same uh, in, in the Marathwada region and Vidarbha region in, in uh, Maharashtra, which is a very drought prone region, you cannot expect to have uh, a very low insurance for sugarcane because sugarcane needs to grow for 12 months at least. In that scenario, when there is a big dry region, the, the Vidarbha region, how will the insurance agency give you loan, right? So this is also uh, very, very specific of the location and the crop that is grown. And so there is very high demand for 
crop statistics for loan and compensation. Expert guidance is important. Uh, like we do get uh, as faculties and rural development faculties, sometimes we get uh, calls to uh, recommend a particular crop type, um, and depending on the soil type, water type, groundwater quality, climate, etc. So for that, we would need more statistics on what was grown in the, in the land, uh, how long was it grown, etc. For example, if you grow uh, sugar cane for a long time, then your soil is depleted of nutrients. It's not only subs uh, fertilizers, subsidized fertilizers you use and the nutrients come up. There's multiple other things that you need to do. One thing is uh, cross uh, cultivation of uh, legumes, which, which arrest nitrogen into the soil. So these aspects are yet to be fully understood. Uh, and for that, we need uh, crop statistics. Then this is the farmer side, the very, very important stakeholders uh, along with the government. So the government and farmers are kind of together. The government uh, operates for the farmers. Uh, the farmers seek the government for help and they have a uh, tie up with the crop statistics. The next one was the agricultural input suppliers like seeds, fertilizers, equipment, pesticides. So these are the companies uh, that actually provide these at a subsidized rate. The subsidy can be given by the government but they're not manufacturing the fertilizers. They're not uh, cultivating uh, hybrid seeds. So that is a different um, entrepreneur track, uh, a startup ecosystem or a company ecosystem uh, that gives seeds. Uh, for example, all agricultural universities uh, work on hybrid seeds and new uh, climate resilient seeds. These seeds can be given to farmers and noted how it grows for which you need crop statistics. Uh, it will grow well in the agricultural universities. Why? Because that land is not totally depleted in nitrogen and, and phosphorus uh, or, fertile, uh, or uh, soil um, nutrients. Uh, and also it has good supply of water. Because it's a research academic institute, uh, water supply is not stopped during the summer seasons and stuff. So good water supply is given because the research has to continue to monitor the crops. So it can grow well in the in the in the lab. It's kind of an open lab, but will it grow well in the land? And that is where this uh, agricultural uh, input suppliers are coming in the picture. They mass produce these uh, seeds and then give it to farmers. So for them, why is it important? They need to know the area, acreage. How much area do you need uh, the seed? You cannot give uh, um, like potato is big now, and and mangoes are very big because uh, they, they actually consume a lot of water. Uh, and India has been looked at uh, as a chief exporter of mango pulp and mango. Uh, mango juice is, is very popular in India. Mango lassi is popular in India uh, for the area. Okay, so where does it grow? How does it grow? So these kind of uh, data are important for the agriculture input suppliers. Uh, geographical distribution, where do they put, the, where do they place their offices? Uh, is is directly linked to the crop statistics. Why would you put uh, a mango, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, agricultural supplier uh, in a region where there's no mango? So that for that we need these kind of uh, assessments. Then shop outlet planning, roadmap, and preparation. So for the future also, if they see that suddenly a system is evolving, like for example in uh, Pune region. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of <clears throat> bananas are being grown uh, from sugarcane areas. Uh, why? Because bananas, the export market is big. Uh, they are exported to uh, Arab countries and uh, along Europe. Uh, so the, there's a good demand for these bananas. Uh, and uh, so there's the, suddenly then you see some shops coming up, some uh, um, brokers, officers that come up to procure the bananas and export it to Europe. So these happen when the crop statistics is there, okay? And the roadmap full-time uh, future preparations, et cetera, are also done. 
So this is also uh, very important to have uh, crop statistics. Then the bank crop insurance companies, not only there are uh, central government schemes to give you insurance, but there are a lot of private in institutes, uh, private banks that give uh, farmers loans. Uh, and for them, they need crop statistics. Again, if you are a banker, you do not want to give a loan to a, to a land which is barren, which is nothing is growing. How, how can a bank give money? So that is where a crop statistics is needed and high, high resolution, high temporal and spatial. 10 years ago, record from the government will not be helpful. So if you go back to the, the record that we took from uh, LULC in Bhuvan website, it is 2015, 2016. How can a bank give now with the data for the 16, six years uh, before? So current data is needed. Uh, and yes, we understand that it is time consuming, uh, but it's good to have high resolution, recent data for helping the farmers and allied, allied people. So these are indirect um, resources for the farmers, the bank, crop insurance, et cetera. So they, what do they use it for? They use it to uh, assess the agricultural loan and insurance. How much insurance can we uh, put based on the location, based on the climate interference and the uh, crop that is grown. If, if it is, uh, for example, like banana in a, in a flood prone region, they will not give a uh, loan that easily or they'll increase the insurance price because uh, banana is very susceptible to floods and cyclones. So only regions where uh, it's very uh, fragile, uh, even if you push the, it, it'll, the, the plantation will fall down. So if a, if a big cyclone or, or a storm comes, it will just uproot the system. So for that, we need better uh, crop statistics. Then we have agricultural retailers, traders, and consumers. Uh, so some of that we already discussed in the agriculture input suppliers. The retailers are the businessmen. For example, if you have uh, a big demand in Mumbai is there for fruits uh, and organic uh, vegetables, broccoli, mushrooms, etc. So where do they get them from? They get them from the villages nearby. So only when the demand is there, the mushroom will be grown. Because uh, in farm uh, land in rural regions, you don't see people eating so much mushroom uh, and or fruits uh, that they grow. So uh, it's all uh, sent, exported to cities. Uh, and that is the demand the agricultural retailers need to know, uh, traders and consumers. So as a consumer, I need to know where my crop has been produced from. Why? Because if I take an apple from thousands of miles away, I am sure that they would have put a lot of uh, preservatives to preserve that apple to come here to my table. Rather than that, if I take an apple, let's say from Kashmir, uh, then what happens is the Kashmir apple has less pesticides and fertilizers because the shelf life is small. Uh, you can you can also bring it in a plane uh, within a day uh, or a truck or a train that India is well connected with. Uh, and you can quickly get it. But for example, if I'm taking uh, uh, an apple from Australia region or um, uh, you know European side, uh, then there's, there, there has to be more care taken for the apple, uh, which also decides on what food I eat, um, right? So nowadays, uh, there are methods to reduce the fertilizers, the uh, uh, processing of food, and some, some other techniques are used. So agricultural retailers, traders, and consumer data is also important because they need to know what is the yield. If there is a one ton requirement of mushroom per day in this for the city of uh, Mumbai and Mumbai area, you cannot just give half a ton. Okay, thousand kilos is thousand kilos. Uh, and and to be honest, if you look at uh, the uh, the student dining rooms and all, they have so much of mushroom because they like uh, these um, mushroom infused food. Uh, so that is the demand. And if you come to other demands like milk and dairy, that is also needed because Mumbai doesn't have much uh, cows. It has to come from outside. So the processing has to happen. Uh, cows have to be reared outside the city. Uh, and for the cows, there is a feed that is needed. So normally if you go to Pune regions, you'll see uh, cows. And just for the cows to eat, there's a lot of maize um, and fodder that is grown. So yield, produce, pricing, storage, planning, all are allied to rural livelihoods. Uh, and for that, there is a very important need for having crop statistics correctly. 
agro based industries are production and storage and, and processing industries as i said uh, once you have uh, the produce uh, they have a factory nearby so there's a lot of fpos farmer producing organizations um, what do they do is they like like uh, 50 to 500 farmers come together and say okay let's do uh, ketchup or, or a jam uh, and so all of them combine their produce uh, and then they process it and then they make the product uh, and this production and storage is highly highly dependent on the crop statistics how much area is crop and how much is the demand so demand let's say mumbai is requiring um, uh, 500 bottles of jam a day uh, so what what would happen is the file is very small but i'm giving an example so they will need to know if they have uh, 5,000 plants to give supply for a 500 uh, jam because the size reduces, right? So you, this is kind of some calculations that is needed based on the statistics uh, of the crop. Uh, so the crop statistics are very, very important for a company. So now you put yourself as a company, a factory that is making jams and juices. Uh, if you're not getting every day the supply, then you will either have to procure the raw material, which is like grapes, uh, banana, mango from very far away, which increases the price and your company will not evolve. Your company will run into losses because every day you cannot change your price of the jam and juice. Uh, but if it is a local area and you know for sure how much crop area acreage is done, crop statistics, uh, then you know how much produce you can do. So you will, you will just say, no, I can only give a 500 jam if you like, we will give it or, or we will convert that into juice or other, other products. And the last but not the least is the international organizations and NGOs. Uh, they are very, very uh, important for the Indian system, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, because they work very closely with the farmers uh, and uh, strive to increase their productivity. So for them, they need to know what is the crop statistics, how much is imported and exported, uh, and research. Research is where we come in, academic institutions like IIT Bombay. Uh, we need to know the crop statistics so that I need to know how much groundwater is extracted, the water balance, uh, and is it sustainable or not. So for example, uh, we saw in the last lecture uh, that uh, the Ganges water, uh, terrestrial water storage is declining. So now we should be telling them that you should not be pumping so much you should reduce the crop acreage. The crop statistics should be reflecting a reduction in the total crop and yield so that the groundwater comes up to sustainable levels. So this is where uh, international agencies and uh, academic institutions come in place, uh, especially NGOs, because NGOs work for the people on the ground. Uh, I'm talking about the agricultural NGOs like uh, Dan Foundation, um, uh, and then uh, we have, uh, IMI, where I was working, A3. Uh, so all these work for the farmers, with the farmers, uh, and they give a, a kind of uh, regulations and rules. So Vasan is one which works for millets, uh, and Odisha government has uh, put Vasan on the millet mission. So what happens is they tell which areas are suitable for uh, growing millets, uh, and they monitor the millet acreage using uh, GIS and satellite data so that they get good account of the acreage and how much uh, is growing. So this is a very important diagram I would like to uh, share with you so that um, um, it's cyclic, it's two ways. Uh, okay, so the government also can give data, the farmers also can give data. Right now, the, the important part is who is giving this data. Okay, so that will be answered in the next slide. You can see that there's a lot of methods to assess uh, crop area, crop type and area. The oldest version and still it's going on is the area measured by tape. So they go to the field, they for a, let's say sugar cane, so they measure the area uh, with the tape, uh, length and breadth, multiply, you get the area, and then you get uh, the acreage, crop statistics. So crop identified by physical verification, they go there, sugar cane, yes, it's sugar cane, uh, manpower is induced, time consuming, uh, prone to manual errors, because you will go there, uh, yeah, sugar cane, you can monitor by your visualization, but then in between there are other crops. And or when you use the tape, you cannot cover the full distance. So approximately they'll say, oh, okay, it's, uh, I look at the field and say, okay, it's uh, 10 by 10 meters. That's all the plot is. 
So these are big, big mistakes because uh, even a meter or two extra will consume more water or more subsidies in, in fertilizers. So data collection and record uh, are maintained on paper, not digitally done. Uh, it is time consuming. The expert has to go there. <coughs> Re-verification of data is not possible. Once you come back, there's no verification of the data uh, as, as described by Panse in 1983. Then we have the DGPS uh, based measurements, which is the uh, digital geo positioning system uh, measurements. Uh, they are measured using high-tech uh, devices um, uh, and they go to the farm, measure the device, use it to measure the area, acreage, etc. Gives accurate measurement, but it lacks in re-verification of the crop type and labor intensive. So you could see that a person has to carry it every single step uh, and then see, okay, this is the area of sugarcane uh, and then they draw the boundaries to bring the data together. So um, then we have uh, satellite-based measurements, which is the remote sensing-based measurements. So the first two are not remote sensing. Uh, both of them are you're physically going and touching the, the plants and uh, monitoring it. Uh, so those are uh, kind of uh, monitoring on the field, whereas satellite-based method is more advanced method. Uh, remote sensing imageries uh, are used uh, uh, using GIS tools, like image processing tools, uh, for identifying the crop type and um, crop acreage, how long, the how big the area is, and three. So this is a spatial term. You have the crop type and crop acreage. The spatial term is done. Now the temporal term is, is it growing throughout the year? If it's growing throughout the year, then you know that it is irrigated, not rain fed. So rain fed is only three months. If, you, if the farmer grows a three month crop, which normally people do, uh, they grow their monsoon crop, very high intensive like paddy, and then they clear the field and then they put sugar cane or, or, or something else uh, which grows um, for one year or less. So yeah, you can identify the irrigated, non-irrigated, the crop type and the crop acreage using the satellite. It's a very fast method. Uh, it does require some uh, resolution data and computing power, but uh, in the current scenarios, the computing powers are fast and or you also have dashboards that I've shown, Google Earth Engine, um, the Sentinel HO uh, Hub, uh, all these are giving you uh, tremendous computing power uh, with just a stable internet. So you don't have to have high power computer. You just tell these are the areas I need, click the button, it will run in the supercomputer of Google and then put it up for your analysis. Then the last but not the least uh, and the most expensive one is drones. It is a type of remote sensing. Uh, they are used to uh, take up high resolution images of land and crops. Uh, it is really good, but the concern is, as I said, the price is really, really uh, heavy. Uh, using these images, crop type and crop acreage can be identified. Uh, it is fast, accurate. As I said, it's very costly and not all can afford it. So you need um, a person to go to the field to fly the drone. Satellite, you can sit here and then map. We can sit here in the live class and then show you how the uh, the NDVI was done, correct? So uh, the point here is uh, drones are good, uh, are very, very accurate, but it consumes a lot of time, money, and capacity is needed. Uh, so with this, I will uh, kind of wrap up today's uh, lecture in the ninth week uh, so that we have a base setup uh, to look at some tools from week 10. Uh, from week 10, what we'll do is we'll look at some indicators using satellite data because of all this data, you already have government data from human-centric approach. Some DGPS measurements are also available. Satellite data is what you can do using the links that I have provided in the class. Uh, for example, the Bhuvan uh, images uh, or the NASA images from uh, GLDS website, uh, GSDISAC and uh, NASA uh, links and also the Sentinel Hub. So I've given you a lot of links where you can download the data and then see how uh, the crop area can be mapped, monitored, and then extracted. This results in considerable rural development because um, after, after a flood or a uh, big damage, uh, you cannot wait for the human-centric approach to happen where people go there and measure the damage and all. That can be done within a day as soon as the satellite data comes, you have a notification, you look at the data, run these analysis, and then plot it. So this is how satellite data can help in saving time and um, uh, opportunities uh, for crop 
type assessment, first crop type, and then crop acreage, which contributes to crop statistics. So with this, uh, I will conclude today's lecture. I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.